in every stage of development, be it a call of God, be it an organization, be it a ministry. I'm sure that if I uh, talk to Pastor Yeni and maybe ask some things about the background of the ministry, how he got involved, how all of you got involved, you'll have stories. Stories of disappointments, stories of, uh, of accomplishments, stories of, of God's favor, stories of all kinds, you'll have stories, I'm sure, I'm sure. Because everything in life, be it a ministry, be it a country, Nigeria is about to celebrate, what, 50 years, right? Jubilee. Every country, United States of America, is relatively a very young democracy. There's over, not under 300 years. There's, there, there are stories. And at the very beginning of every organization, very beginning of every society, we begin with the survival stage. Survival stage is when things look as if, are they going to happen or are they going to fall apart? Then we move from stability, I mean survival stage to stability stage. And in fact, this parallel, even in childbirth, the very first few years of a child's life are very, I mean, critical. At that point, you want to vaccinate the child because the child is vulnerable, doesn't have the immune system, survival stage. So when God gives you a call, the same way, you have to nurture it, amen? You have to nurture it, so the survival stage. Then we move to stability stage. But that is not God's ultimate best. In our callings, in our purpose, God wants us to move to the third stage, and that's the stage of significance. In fact, I want to find the name. I say, neighbor, neighbor. God has called you, has called you. To, a point to a point of significance. Of significance. Find another neighbor. I say, neighbor, neighbor. I think he's talking to you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We don't need to open it, but I want to read this scripture, which many of us might be familiar with. You can write it down. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 13 through 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 13 through 23. And as you see, there is what I call the threefold cry creation. Verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Amen? Amen. It goes on to say, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by his own choice, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning. Verse 22 of now Romans 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation is saying something is wrong. Something is wrong. The original plan was that man have dominion. We are not, I mean, creation is saying, I'm not supposed to be dominating man. Man is supposed to be dominating me. Creation itself is speaking. But the Bible goes on to say that we, in verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, of, of, of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption, our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. But then what I like here is that the Bible says that in verse 26, skipping out of verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans. There goes that word groans, that words cannot express. So creation grows. We who have the first fruits who are born again, we grow within ourselves saying, Lord, there's more. The limitation of this of this body, you know, Lord, where, where the Bible says, and in, in Paul was speaking in, in Corinthians, it says that we, we, we long to be to leave this body and, and be, be clothed on, amen, with a glorified body. In other words, there's something more, and this body limits us. So we grow with ourselves, but we have the aid of the Holy Spirit. He grows also with words, I mean, with, with expressions that words cannot express. So we see that there's a threefold nature in, in earth that is growing. But because of what is going on in the confusion, I found that even Christians fall into this category. Please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Particularly in Nigeria, when I was here, particularly in the 80s, when we, <laughs> when we quoted this scripture, warfare was viewed from a perspective of just pulling down principalities and powers. Certainly that is part of it. But I wanted to shed some light on something particular that Paul mentions here. That it bears uh, emphasis. It says here in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
uh, verse 3. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, But though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. But then look at the next verse. Verse 5 is key. We demolish arguments. Amen? Amen. That, does that sound like warfare? <laughs> In the natural, it doesn't sound like warfare, but that is warfare. We demolish arguments, and particularly what kind of arguments? He goes on to say, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In other words, there are arguments, there are theories. Where do you think the theory of evolution came from? Right out of hell. And you, you'll be amazed how many people, I mean, in, in, particularly in the West, I go back to that, the whole Western civilization based on the Darwin's theory of, of, of evolution, redefining God, in other words, secular humanism. There's no longer God, you are your own God, do what you, what you want to do, no consequence. That's pretty much the idea. You are God. You are God. And when I say you are God, you are supreme God. That's what they're trying, trying to create. No consequences. If you deem it right, then it's right. If you say it's wrong, then it's wrong. No moral uh, uh, background. Going back to what we mentioned from uh, this morning, foundation. God always lays the foundation. And when we get away from the foundation, we get into error. So look at what we see here. It says here, we demolish argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And I'm going to really go a step further. There's some thoughts that you have about yourself that needs to be demolished. Do you know why? Because if it doesn't go in sync with God's plan for life, it needs to be demolished. Amen? And consequently, I found that, that people begin to develop myths of how they define themselves. If you have, a, uh, you know, if, you're writing, if you're writing down this message, I want you to write this uh, myth number one. This is what this myth says. I am what I do. Very subtle. It sounds on the surface to, be, to sound okay. And I remember I was sharing this a long time ago. Since then, I won't mention his name, but you all know if I mention his name, and, and I'm sure you're going to be thinking about when I, when I mention what I'm about to say. This particular artist, worldwide artist, just died about maybe six months ago or so. <laughs> okay, you got, you got my point. I was talking about this three years ago. In fact, I, was, I think it was Lagos, Nigeria. I was sharing this. I watched an interview, and probably many of you saw the same interview. A British reporter uh, began to ask this mega star, says, who is so-and-so? Who is so-and-so? Who are you? He was trying to identify us. So the, the, the artist began to say, oh, this is what I do. This is how I perform. Defining himself by what he did on stage. So the reporter says, I know all that. I mean, who didn't really know all that? It was common knowledge. This guy had a gift that was so clear. So for a period of about 15 seconds, the artist was totally quiet. And he could not answer the question because he had defined himself completely by what he did. And you see, the, the trick here is this. If who we are is totally dependent on what we do, then who do we become when we stop doing what we do? 